The Subcommittee of the Constitution and Civil Justice will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recess of the committee at any time. We welcome everyone to today's hearing on the Lawsuit Abuse and the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, and I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Today's hearing will examine lawsuit abuse of the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, or TCPA, as we will likely refer it. The TCPA is enacted in 1991. It established several enforcement mechanisms, including a private right of action for consumers to bring claims for receiving certain auto-dialed calls, pre-recorded calls, and faxes they did not consent to receive. This law also established a private right of action for certain telemarketing calls made in violation of a consumer's status on the federal do not call list. At the time of its passage, the TCPA was a sensible legislative response to consumers and businesses who were overwhelmed with unwanted calls and faxes. But with advances in technology, government regulators have struggled to interpret the TCPA's antiquated language to new situations. An increasing amount of regulations and court interpretations has produced a lack of clarity that is empowering plaintiff's attorneys to sue companies that are contacting their customers for legitimate reasons. Damages can easily become exponential given that each violation can amount to $500 even if no actual harm to the consumer was caused. Plaintiff's attorneys are encouraged to use abusive litigation tactics such as waiting for these violations to pile up. A lawsuit against Rubio's Restaurant provides an unfortunate example of these tactics. Rubio's is a California-based restaurant chain that uses a messaging system to send food safety alerts to its employees. When an employee's cell phone number was reassigned to a person who was not an employee, the messaging system continued sending alerts to that number. The restaurant didn't know that the number had been reassigned because the telephone company is not required to notify the business. Over time, the person with this phone number waited to accumulate 876 alerts before filing a $500,000 TCPA lawsuit. This is clearly an abuse. Rubio's Restaurant isn't the only business that's been unfairly targeted with TCPA litigation. According to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Institute for Legal Reform, American businesses are besieged with lawsuits brought under the TCPA with many attorneys and individual consumers making their living through suing companies for any text, any call, or any facsimile placed to numbers that had been provided to those companies for such communication purposes. Indeed, it is not rare for alleged statutory damages for punitive class actions brought under the TCPA to be billions of dollars when large companies with millions of customers are sued. Small businesses, too, are finding that their very ex existence threatened by the TCPA uh, lawsuits. A Federal Communications Commission, which is, tasking, which is tasked with interpreting and enforcing the TCPA, has noted an increasing number of TCPA-related lawsuits in recent years and believes this is due to a lack of clarity in the law's interpretation. In 2014, Commissioner Michael O'Reilly stated, over time, as the FCC and the courts have interpreted the TCPA, business models and ways of communicating with consumers have also changed. As a result, the rules have become complex and unclear. In addition to prohibiting abusive robocalls and junk faxes, which was the original intent, the rules are creating situations where consumers might not receive notifications and offers that they want and expect and where new and innovative services and applications that help friends and family members communicate with each other could be restricted. My hope is that today's hearing will explore the unintended consequences of the TCPA and the lawsuit abuse, which has grown into an industry and arisen from it. And although this law may require an update, we must keep in mind the original goal of the TCPA, which is to protect the privacy interests of this nation's consumers. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. I look forward to your testimony. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the subcommittee on the Constitution Civil Justice, Mr. Cohen of Tennessee, for his opening statement. Mr. Cohen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this committee today will subcommittee consider a topic that we've never considered before, which is uh, somewhat refreshing, even if it's a question that probably shouldn't come here in this subcommittee because it normally would fit into energy and commerce. Somehow it got uh, civil justice and constitution, 
which probably should be dealing with something concerning maybe obstruction of justice or uh, other issues of our, our democracy. But we're here with this bill today, or this hearing, this issue, and it would weak, weaken the, the, the private right of action under the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, a statute over which this committee has no jurisdiction. The truth of the matter is this committee, if it came to Judiciary Committee, this should be in the criminal law subcommittee, in my opinion. Uh, because I think anybody that violates this probably shouldn't be sued and shouldn't necessarily pay civil damages. They should be sentenced to a life in a small room with one telephone that rings constantly with recorded <laughs> messages. I detest these calls. And now that we have cell phones, my landline, which resides in Memphis, Tennessee, in my home with my cat, who is probably disturbed as well by the calls that come when I'm not there, when I check my service, the only calls I get are from these automatic callers. It's rather inconvenient. I've got to go through and erase them before I might find one constituent. The TCPA prohibits the use of certain automotion technologies like auto dialers or predictive dialers to call or fax a person with allegedly prior express consent, but sometimes that's pretty loose. Uh, and, and it could be just providing one's phone number to a potential caller, and sometimes you can kind of get hooked into that. Uh, I might have done that this morning. I hope not, but they said, what's your phone number? And I thought, what, what business is it of yours? But I decided to be nice and give them my number. I'm sure I will now get phone calls forever from them. Uh, the act has been rightly interpreted to cover text messages and calls to cell phones now. So we might get one right here if I should turn my dialer on, my alarm. Anyone harmed by a violation is entitled to injunctive relief and the greater of actual monetary damages or statutory damages of $500 per violation, and it's strict liability. Uh, for years now, corporate defendants have come before the subcommittee to attack the robust use of private civil litigation to enforce various federal statutes ranging from civil rights statutes to the False Claims Act to people with disabilities and violations of the uh, disabilities law. These corporate interests seek to paint lawsuits as somehow illegitimate uh, and unfair to well-intentioned businesses as simply made an honest mistake in failing to comply with the law. Yet such arguments ignore the central role that private rights of action play in the enforcement of these type federal laws. Congress's intent and the way this works in structuring the TCPA and these other laws that we've had come before us, strict liability, is statutory damages for any violation, which was to put the onus on the business, not the consumers, to comply with the TCPA and to force businesses, not consumers, to bear the risk association associated with such noncompliance. Indeed, without the incentives contained in the TCPA to bring private lawsuits against violators, there may well be little enforcement. According to one law review article, private parties have largely been responsible for the enforcement of the TCPA because of the relatively large statutory damages amount, especially when compared to actual harm and the lack of enforcement by government agencies. So without this, you really wouldn't have any enforcement, and you would have more and more phone calls and people that did honestly, not honestly, maybe make a little mistake, like that restaurant, but these other awful people that call you and tell you about your getting a uh, uh, your order for a hearing aid or your uh, monitor to keep depressed when you fall in your home. It's really galling to get those because they assume that you're going to fall soon, uh, which is certainly a, something that, that comes when they find that you're over 65 years of age. Uh, few would quarrel with or admit to quarreling with the policy goals underlying the TCPA. Uh, no one wants to be flooded with hundreds of robocalls and spam text messages. Congress passed the TCPA to protect consumers from extreme nuisance and invasions of privacy caused by such activities. And while the TCPA enforcement through private litigation has been relatively successful, the Federal Trade Commission still received more than 5 million TCPA-related complaints in 2016. 5 million. It would have been 4 million if I didn't file my complaints, but it was included, so it's 5 million. So the last thing Congress should be doing is weakening the private right of action. If anything, we should be carrying more, not less vigorous litigation to enforce the act, and we should be including criminal damages of being isolated in that room with that one phone that rings every 30 minutes. I thank our witness, and I look forward to today's discussion, and I look forward to the day that there are no automatic phone calls ever again. I yield back the balance of my time. 
The gentleman uh, makes his point and returns his time. The chair now recognizes the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Goodlatte of Virginia, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Telephone Consumer Protection Act was enacted in 1991 to stem the tide of unsolicited calls and fax advertisements that consumers were receiving on a daily basis. While well-intentioned, this law unfortunately reflects the dangers of legislation with broad intent but narrow application to specific technologies. One legal scholar has pointed out that a major concern raised during Congress's consideration of this legislation was that fax recipients were bearing the cost of ink and paper for the fax advertisement they received. Indeed, in the early 1990s, three-fourths of facsimile machines in the United States printed faxes on rolls of costly thermal transfer paper. A fax machine that uh, printed on regular copier paper existed, but cost over $2,000. Ten years later, the average price of a fax machine that used copier paper dropped to around $100. Today, fax machines are much less frequently used, and many have been replaced with servers that allow recipients to view faxes on computers without printing them at all. Just as technology has changed since the early 1990s, so has litigation surrounding the TCPA. According to the FTC, an increasing number of TCPA violations involve internet-based calls generated from outside the United States. The FTC has also reported that approximately 59% of phone spam cannot be traced or blocked because the phone calls are routed through a web of automatic dialers called ID spoofing and voice over internet protocols. In contrast, a report cited in Ms. Walquist's written testimony states that between 2010 and 2016, there was a 1,372% increase in case filings. If advances in technology have made it more difficult to find intentional, intentional violators of the TCPA, then who's being sued? The answer could be U.S. businesses that are not actually violating the law. In many cases, TCPA litigation is arising from a lack of clarity in the law's application, which is being exploited by attorneys seeking big payouts. Unfortunately, the TCPA neither anticipates the effects of new technology nor these emerging legal trends. I hope that today's hearing sheds some light on the lawsuit abuse of the TCPA and what Congress can do to modernize and improve it. We must protect consumers from being forced to foot the bill for unsolicited advertisements, and we must also ensure that the law is not abused by a cottage industry of over-aggressive trial lawyers seeking to line their own pockets. I want to thank all the witnesses for testifying today, and I look forward to their testimony. Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman for Virginia, and he returns, returns his time. The chair would now recognize the ranking member for a request. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to request to enter the statement of, uh, of the ranking member of the committee, Conyers, on this subject. Without objection, uh, so ordered, his statement will be entered into the record. And uh, I now, um, without objection, other members' uh, opening statements will be made a part of the record. Okay, and by request of staff, before I introduce the witnesses, I would like to enter into the record a letter from trade associations and business groups representing hundreds of thousands of U.S. companies in support of this hearing. A letter from the Credit Union National Associations, the written statement of Richard Warwick, President and CEO of the MSR Group based in Omaha, Nebraska, a statement from the American Association of Healthcare Administrative Management, and a statement from the Electronic Privacy Information Center. Request enter the record without hearing no objection, so ordered. And uh, now I'd like to um, introduce the witnesses. Our first witness is uh, Mr. Rob Sweeney. He's the founder and CEO of Mobile Media Technologies, LLC, Mr. Sweeney. And our second witness is Becca Walquist, a partner at Snell and Wilmer, LLP. And our third witness is Hassan Zavari, a partner at Tyco and Zavari, LLP. And uh, our fourth witness is Adonis Hoffman. And Mr. Hoffman is the founder and chairman of Business and the Public Interest Incorporated. Each of the witnesses' written statements will be entered into the record in its entirety. I ask that each witness summarize his or her testimony in five minutes or less. To help you stay within that time, there's a light in front of you and the light switch will turn from green to yellow and indicates you have a minute left. We'd ask you to summarize your statement uh, at that point. 
When the light turns red, it indicates that the witnesses' five minutes have expired. But before I recognize the witnesses, it is a tradition of this subcommittee that you all be sworn in, so please stand to be sworn in. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give before this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yeah. Thank you. You may be seated. Let the record show that all the witnesses responded in the affirmative. And now I'd like to recognize our first witness, uh, Mr. Sweeney. Um, please turn on your microphone and we'll be happy to hear your testimony. Chairman King, Ranking Member Cohen, members of the subcommittee, I'm grateful for the opportunity to address you today and tell you my story about how the TCPA has deeply harmed my business. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a small businessman. Had an idea in 2003 to invent a permission-based mass text messaging solution. I did so. Primarily for non-commercial messages to be sent by schools and hospitals, TV stations, newspapers, you know, just nonprofit organizations. And they would send the content out to people who would opt in and the process they used to opt in, we refer to as a two-step out-of-band authentication process. It's probably a process you have all used at some point in your life. It includes opting in, having a code sent to your phone, and then entering that code back into a website. That's what we used to enable web-based opt-in for our clients. That process is part of the patent that I was issued in 2007. It's also the process used by the wireless carrier, CTIA, Mobile Marketing Association's best practices for web-based opt-in. A little bit about Textcaster uh, and who uses us. Like I said, schools use us. If you have children in school and, and there's an issue or emergency, it would be used to communicate that to the parents and to other members. TV stations use it to uh, send out weather alerts and breaking news. If about 11 o'clock at night and you're in bed and there's a tornado warning and you're opted into your TV station or newspaper's news alerts, you're going to get a message that's going to wake you up. You have opted in. You have gone through that two-step process and authenticated yourself as who you are and, and you have control of that phone number. The TCPA declaratory ruling order in 20, 2015 included some language that was onerous, was very broad, about the, the, the ability to opt out using any reasonable means. Well, one lawyer, one plaintiff, decided to opt into 99 of our clients. And when they would get the first message, they would revoke consent by replying stop. Now, we didn't support the stop request at that time because we didn't need to. The carriers didn't require it. And so they just kept going and going and receiving these. And by the way, when they opted in, they opted in and immediately opted out. So this was nothing more than a, a manufacturing scam to create potential lawsuits. Well, that person that did that used six different numbers under six different names and basically was, when the attorneys got a hold of this, they decided to send out threat letters to our, uh, to our customers demanding payments into the millions. Um, and we had been working on the stop request, but I'm a little company and I've got 120 wireless carriers that I got to work with, and I had a plan to support Stop long before the, the uh, DRO was issued in July. So it took us 120 days. In the meantime, the threat letters started coming in. We recognized the threat letters serious. We hired counsel, very competent counsel, to help us address the issue. Developed, our, our counsel developed six defense points, shared them with the councils of our media properties who were being sued. Our media properties were getting these demand letters, and these demand letters were into the millions of dollars, all by a shakedown. 
that's what it was happening. At, at the end of the day, no lawsuits have been filed. One customer chose to settle a million dollar demand for $15,000. My company lost $300,000 a year in business from media clients who did not want to wade back into this because of an onerous statute. I've incurred over $100,000 in legal expenses and I've had a reduction in force to deal with this. You know, to the lawyer, it's all about money. To me, it's about my livelihood. It's about my livelihood for the, for the employees who work for me. To our customers that we're getting these messages, they're not getting them anymore because their media properties choose not to participate anymore. So I'm just asking you to consider and be thoughtful of the kind of language, language that is used when you're putting this into place and putting small businesses like us at risk to perform a service that, again, I would bet that all of you and your families have probably used at some point or other. Thank you. Thank the gentleman for his testimony and now recognize the gentlelady, Ms. Walkris, for her five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman King, Ranking Member Cohen, members of the subcommittee. My name is Becca Walquist. I'm a partner at Snell & Wilmer. I'm, I'm chair of the firm's TCPA Defense Practice Group. I'm honored to represent the U.S. Chamber Institute for Legal Reform in testifying before you today. For over 15 years now, I have defended various companies sued under the TCPA for a variety of communications made via phone, text, or facsimile. So I've been a first-hand witness to the growing cottage industry of TCPA plaintiff's lawyers and plaintiffs targeting American businesses. I can confirm that in the past few years, the problems with TCPA litigation abuse do continue to worsen. TCPA litigation is booming. It's less about protecting consumers and more about driving a multi-million dollar commercial enterprise of TCPA lawsuits using the statute's private right of action. Indeed, the lawsuits filling up our court dockets, for the most part, are not even about the spammed marketing calls that Mr. Cohen mentioned that annoy and harass persons with marketing messages sent with spoofed caller IDs in a matter that flouts all regulations. Those are the overseas-based aggressive spam robocallers. That's what's causing most of the complaints to the FCC. That is not what is being targeted in the many thousands of TCPA actions brought in our courts every year. Instead, the primary targets of the TCPA litigation are legitimate American businesses trying to comply with the law and to contact their own customers in a matter consented to by that customer. The lawsuits are frequently about informational and transactional calls, not marketing, flu shot reminders, credit card reject notifications, suspensions of account warnings, not marketing calls for the most part. It takes just one text or call or fax to form the basis of a nationwide class action lawsuit alleging damages on behalf of millions of people for potentially billions of dollars. Every 10,000 communications alleged to violate the TCPA puts $5 million of statutory damages at issue. Not great news for one restaurant that I work with who sent text messages only to people who went through the double opt-in process described by Mr. Sweeney who wanted to get notifications and coupons and hey, here's a deal at the restaurant today, and they signed up for this text program. Uh, there was an issue where the vendor who'd been pro handling the program was losing the business. A new vendor was going to be coming in. The old vendor, angry, <laughs> one would guess that he was losing this business, provided the list of members. Here's the text club members, but it was an inaccurate list. And so, unknown to this company, they sent one text message to what is alleged to be 64,000 people in that group who had not, should not have been on the group. And now they're facing themselves for one text message that one person complained about, a lawsuit alleging $32 million of statutory damages. And that's just one example. My, my testimony speaks of others. The problem is that there's no cap on TCPA damages, as with all the other consumer private right of action statutes. Um, that don't require any kind of actual damages. And so with that uncapped damages available, you just find lawsuits being brought against very well-intentioned companies that, as with the restaurant example I gave you, you know, one complaint, one mistake, 
$32 million in allegations. And there are multiple law firms that are joining up often to bring these lawsuits against the deeper pocket companies. So TCPA class actions are driven by the desire for attorney's fees awards that will be pulled from common class funds. And these attorney's fees dwarf the recovery for individual consumers. And in my written testimony, I speak of the statistics um, about the average class member recovery versus the millions of dollars recovered by the attorneys. Importantly, it's not just large companies that find themselves targeted. Businesses of all sizes have, I've worked with in, in my TCPA defense work. Social media companies, electric companies, banks, sports teams, pharmacies, plumbing companies, ski resort, an accountant, a school board, local dentist office, a blood bank. They've all found themselves defending against TCPA litigations and facing potentially annihilating statutory damages. The TCPA, importantly, is not just a liability trap, but a vicarious liability trap as well. As I discuss in my statement, lawyers on the TCPA front do tend to sue the deepest pockets. So companies who never sent or retained anyone to send a text message or a call find themselves being sued, potentially because their product was mentioned in a communication sent by, some, by someone else. And when they get these lawsuits, the pressure to settle is enormous, even, without, even if you have a meritorious defense, because there are potentially billions of dollars of statutory damages that could be in play. So t TCPA litigation is not decreasing. My statement highlights that it continues to pick up steam year after year, and more people are catching on to the funds that can be sought through TCPA litigations. So I cover most of this in my written testimony, and would be happy to answer any questions um, later on in the proceeding. Thank you. The gentlelady's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman, Mr. Zavari, for his five minutes. Chairman King, Ranking Member Cohen, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify here today. I'm the founding partner of Tico and Zavari LLP, which is a private public interest law firm that represents small businesses, consumers, and whistleblowers. Before founding Tico and Zavari, I worked for years at Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher, representing corporate clients. Since then, I've litigated class actions and individual actions in state and federal court across the country. I'd like to begin by addressing why we're here today. Ostensibly, this hearing is about lawsuit abuse. But we must ask, what constituents are complaining about this supposed abuse? Are constituents, in fact, calling your offices and complaining that they want to receive more robocalls and more unsolicited text messages? I submit to you that the reason we are here is because there is a powerful business interest in opening up the floodgates to our last bastion of privacy, which is our tel cellular telephones. The TCPA has succeeded in keeping invasive telemarketing at bay, and some businesses don't like that. The real question is, do American people want Congress to make it easier for businesses to flood their cell phones with telemarketing calls and text messages? The most commonly abused trope of opponents to the TCPA is that the TCPA is being abused to inhibit the actions of legitimate businesses. We've already heard that today. But the TCPA is not concerned with the legitimacy or illegitimacy of the business. The TCPA is concerned with the legitimacy or illegitimacy of the conduct. Legitimate businesses can and do engage in illegitimate communications, and legitimate businesses are not prohibited from engaging in legitimate communications. All they need to do is obtain consent, and that's not too much to ask. Moreover, exceptions do exist for almost every important communications. There's an exception for medical messages. There's an exception for school closings. There's an exception for emergencies. There's an exception for utilities who want to notify constituents about power outages. There's an exception for fraud verification. Quite simply, this is a narrow statute. As you consider tinkering with the TCPA, I ask you to imagine a world where our cell phone privacy has no protections. Imagine your cell phone ringing with calls from banks, cable companies, phone companies, gyms trying to sell their goods and services. Imagine calls from businesses you have no relationship with. Imagine text messages from every company you ever thought about doing business with 
And then imagine more calls and text messages from companies you never, ever thought of. Now, imagine the calls from your constituents about their cell phones, which have now become virtually useless because you removed the protections of the TCPA. The TCPA has protected cell phones as the last bastion of privacy since their introduction into society. Relaxing those restrictions would turn this personal space into nothing more than a nonstop advertising nuisance. Congress deliberately crafted a free market approach to curtail runaway telemarketing, and private enforcement is working. Yes, the numbers of suits are in fact going up, but that's not because of bad actors or abuse by plaintiffs as uh, the opponents would have us believe. It's because of the skyrocketing numbers of robocalls and text messages. It's true that there were 4,800 suits in 2016, but that's only 0.1% of the over 4 million complaints to the FTC and the FCC in the same time period. Yes, there, there, there are bad actors, but there are ways to control that, and courts have addressed these. Courts have sanctioned bad uh, actors, they've dismissed their claims from the very beginning, and they've found that they're inadequate to be class representatives. I wanna just give one example of how TCPA class actions actually do work. A lawsuit was brought by two law firms against Caribbean Cruise, which is a legitimate business, which began making phone calls to, uh, to people that it, whose phone numbers they obtained, robocalls, where they pretended falsely to be engaging in a survey and, once peop and, and promising a free cruise if they engaged in the survey. This was a fraudulent practice. I got the text message, I got the robocall, and I imagine uh, Mr. Uh, Cohen is indicating he received it. I imagine many others received that same text message. 50 million calls made by that company. That company was sued. It took four years to bring that company to justice. Those attorneys expended over $5 million in attorney's fees without any guarantee of compensation before finally obtaining a settlement in the amount of 56, a minimum of 56 million with a maximum of $76 million. The, the class members from that settlement will receive $135 per call. The TCPA is not perfect, but the free market private enterprise mechanism works. If Congress fiddles with it, it risks removing the best and last line of defense of one of our few remaining realms of privacy. I thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Zavari, and I now recognize Mr. Hoffman for his five-minute testimony. Mr. Hoffman. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before your subcommittee to discuss the important issues surrounding lawsuit abuse and the TCPA. I'm here today in my individual capacity Although I serve as Chairman of Business in the Public Interest, Incorporated, and teach as an adjunct professor at Georgetown, I am not representing any company, client, firm, organization, trade association, or entity concerning this issue, and I have not received any compensation uh, from anyone concerning this matter, nor am I arguing for or against any specific legislation that is pending before Congress. Uh, it's a special honor for me to return to these hallways. I spent several years as a legislative director committee council and subcommittee staff director in the House during the 97th, 98th, and 102nd Congresses. Uh, serving during those times changed my life and my career, and I have the greatest affinity and highest regard for this, in this institution and the work that you do. In addition to Congress, I spent 30 years as a lawyer in Washington, D.C., working in private practice at a policy think tank and as in-house counsel for a trade association. But most relevant to this hearing, uh, I recently served as chief of staff and senior legal advisor to FCC Commissioner Clyburn from 2013 to 2015 during the pendency and consideration of the TCPA. Um, <clears throat> in 2015, I coined the phrase TCPA, total cash for plaintiff's attorneys. Um, it was a little flippant remark, but it signified to me what the TCPA has come to, uh, come to signify under its current uh, interpretation. In 2015, the FCC noted that it has sought to reasonably accommodate individuals' rights to privacy as well as, as the legitimate business interests of telemarketers and other callers. But all is not well. Somewhere along the line, the balance that was originally intended shifted from business concerns and consumers into the hands of plaintiff's lawyers. <clears throat> I met with dozens of interested parties as part of the FCC review of petitions. We heard from banks, 
credit agencies, debt collectors, educational institutions, financial institutions, healthcare providers, insurance companies, retailers, service providers, utility companies, and other commercial entities. We also heard from trade associations representing numerous industries. And last but not least, we heard at the FCC from attorneys and law firms representing classes of consumers suing under the TCPA. The business voices told, the F told us that the TCPA was harming business because it paralyzed their ability to communicate effectively and efficiently with consumers and customers by telephone. The consumer voices told us what uh, Mr. Zavari has, has, has said. Let me give you the names of a few companies that uh, might be household names for you. Capital One, $75 million settlement. ATT Mobility, $45 million settlement. Sirius XM, $35 million settlement. JP Morgan Chase, $34 million. Bank of America, $32 million. MetLife, $23 million. Wells Fargo, $16 million. Papa John's Pizza, $16 million. Walgreens Pharmacy, $11 million. And scores of other below. These are not bad companies. They're not doing necessarily anything um, consciously uh, incorrect or unlawful. In fact, most of these companies came to the FCC to say, we want to comply with the TCPA, but we don't know how because it's so ambiguous. The least misstep can lead us to strict liability. <clears throat> the proliferation of class action lawsuits under TCPA has been tracked and well documented by uh, uh, others at the Institution for Legal, for Legal Reform. I pointed out in a recent article in the Wall Street Journal, the average recovery for a consumer in TCPA class action settlement was $4.12. $4.12, you can't even get Starbucks for $4.12. Their lawyers, by contrast, received an average of $2.4 million. Something is wrong with this picture. As a lawyer, as a consumer, and as a citizen, I think that the system needs to be adjusted. We tend to focus on the sensational settlements reached by big companies as well as we should, as we should. but there's another dimension of the TCPA, and that is potentially devastating effect on a small, on small minority and community-based businesses. For these organizations, a TCPA claim could mark the end of their existence due to the strict liability mandate, which can mean millions of dollars or hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in, uh, in fees for their companies that can least afford it. <clears throat> Let's be honest. Nobody here likes robocalls. None of us relish intrusive calls from telemarketers, even if their data show that we might be interested in what they have to say. But, on the other hand, there is a valuable function and utility to allowing companies to communicate with their customers, their clients, their patients, or patrons without fear of costly legal action in essence, business should be able to talk to the people they serve. In summary, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I would recommend that Congress has authority to end this burden on American businesses, large and small. There are three things that you can do to, take ch to change what is a growing problem for U.S. companies under TCPA. One, impose a liability cap on TCPA awards, amend key provisions of the TCPA, and three, provide a safe harbor for substantial compliance. Appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and stand ready to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman, and all the witnesses for your testimony. Uh, Chair will now recognize himself for, for my five minutes and appreciate your recommendations on what we should do, and I'll try to circle back to you at the end of my time here. I, uh, I first wanted to turn to Ms. Walquist and, and uh, ask you if you have any data or you can give us this committee a sense of how many of these cases uh, that are filed actually go through the full litigation and what percentage of them dollar-wise or plaintiff-wise or um, attorney-wise are settled out of court? The problem is that that kind of data doesn't really exist. I'm working on putting together um, an analysis of about 3,000 filed litigations uh, that were filed in a 17-month period. And I speak about some of the early findings in my testimony, and we'll have more information later this year. But the pre-litigation demands aren't reported anywhere. I know from clients that I have, and some of the bigger companies, they're receiving anywhere from 20 to 50 letters a month saying, you've called me, I have a TCPA cause of action. And again, these are calls that are made with what the company believes to be the prior consent. So it might be someone saying, I revoked. It might be somebody saying, my number is a new number and you were trying to reach someone else. But there's significant amounts of demands. Something else that's hard to track that plays into 
what companies are dealing with are arbitrations. And I have one company that's a bank that is right now dealing with over 120 individual arbitrations. So that's not anything that's tracked in the court system as well. And, and many companies that have arbitration clauses are dealing with their TCPA litigation there. Okay, then could I just uh, ask you, what's your judgment on this? I mean, is it a number over or under 50, 50%? 50 What's your, if I picked a number, can you give me which side you'd be on for over under on this? I mean, I'm, as I'm listening to your testimony and the balance of the testimony that's here, uh, I get the sense that a lot of this is settled out of court. And, and if that is the case, uh, I'm gonna follow up with a question of, why don't we have more people fighting this more? I can tell you there's only one company that I'm aware of that after a class was certified went to trial on TCPA litigation and didn't settle. So pretty much everyone settles. The one company that did go to litigation was Dish Network, and it went to litigation on a small group of only 50, 51,000 calls. And with the treble damages it just got from the jury verdict, it just got hit with $61 million on 51,000 calls. And so... Are, are you aware that is, is, there, is there any professional liability insurance that a company can buy to protect themselves from this? One massive problem with the TCPA is that as soon as these litigations really started being brought in 2001 to 2004, almost every insurance policy started putting specific carve-outs in their insurance policies for TCPA. So many companies that come to me or, or clients who are, who are like, I've, I've got this lawsuit, can I turn this into insurance? I say, give me your insurance policy. We look at it, specific carve-outs. The insurance companies don't the want to touch The answer is that these. insurance that did exist is disappearing the more this accelerates? Exactly, and the problem with that is that companies who believe that they would have coverage for something like a mistake, or let's say, like the MetLife settlement you were discussing, where you have a one agent who's gone rogue and is sending out facsimiles in violation of company policy, mm. You know, you end up in a settlement of $23 million. Okay, thank you. I want to, my clock is ticking. I wanted to make sure I gave Mr. Sweeney an opportunity to vent himself a little bit more. Um, I, I would I would just, um, I want to propose a, an idea to you, and I'll do it in a quick form, but uh, what if you had an opportunity, if someone filed, say, a $10 million claim against you, if you had an opportunity to um, recover that from the other side, uh, would that make it more interesting to? I'd do it in a heartbeat. And, and Why in, your case, interested. in your case, is it it's settled? We were never sued. Our customers were sued. But in the data that we that we have uh, pulled from our from from the one person and the one attorney, we feel pretty strongly that that there might even be a claim for some civil RICO in here on how the collusion went down to go against our customers. Significant dollars. But at the end of the day, I'm the one that's lost the most money. So, you know, I would welcome that opportunity. Is that, and just it's so often I see that the reason I ask the insurance question is so often the insurance company will come in and advocate for a settlement and then just adjust their premiums accordingly, and the insured professional is essentially out of that equation except for the premiums they get, get charged. So um, it doesn't quite apply in this, in this case, but I have uh, in past drafted legislation not introduced here in this Congress that would allow the the, the um, subject of, uh, of litigation to post a bond for the claim and recover that off of their insurance company if the insurance company decided to settle. But that's getting narrower and that won't solve this problem. I see that my clock has, has run down. I, I thank all the witnesses and I wish I had a little more time. I'd recognize the ranking member from Tennessee uh, for his five minutes. The ranking member from, from Tennessee. Tennessee is from New York now. Uh, uh, the, the, half the, ranking from, the gentleman from New York, uh, Mr. Nadler. No one has ever suggested before that I was from Tennessee. Nothing wrong with Tennessee, but not as good as New York. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Zavari, if I hope I pronounced it right. Zavari. Z Mr. Zavari, I'm sorry. Um, we've heard uh, 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 the criticisms of the burden this places on businesses. Uh, I presume, that, and oh, well, let, me, let me just say, uh, Mr. Hoffman complained that in, in, in a lot of cases the average recovery was $4.12 and, the, and the, 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 uh, attorneys made a lot of money. Let me just say that that doesn't impress me even if true because the aim is not to recover the $4.12. The aim is to stop the conduct. And if a class action suit in which lots of $4.12 claims which nobody's going to pursue through, through the courts 
as a class action can be pursued and stop the conduct which is annoying thousands of millions of people, that's well worth it. Would you comment on that, Mr. Zavari? Yes, I agree completely that the, the primary purpose here is deterrence, and that is working. I would also take issue with the statistic which dates back to a letter drafted by a law firm, and when you go back to the source of that statistic, there's no data to support it. It covers one year, it only includes class actions, and it's, I believe it's, it's just frankly untrue. Um, and class actions only account for 24% of all cases, so it doesn't include uh, settlements that are individual cases. It's just, it's a, it's a number that keeps being thrown about that has zero basis. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Walquist. Um, you've uh, been quite eloquent about some of the problems here, um, but I gather that your solution is to repeal the law, stop the class actions, and subject Americans to all the problems that caused the enactment of the law in the first place, namely millions of robocalls. What do you think specifically should be done briefly in a way that wouldn't uh, undo the purpose of the law? Yes, I think that some of the main things that need to be put into place would be a damages cap of some sort because there's no other consumer statute like this with a private right of action, no actual damages, and no damages cap. There should be affirmative defenses put into the statute for companies that are trying to comply with the law, have policies and procedures to comply. Wait a Stat, uh, uh, cap on damages, affirmative defenses. The, the, the statute of limitations should be put into the statute. The problem was there was none put in, so the default of four years has been applying. I have cases that have been brought three years and 11 months after a call or a text message, and that's You think really three years and 11 months is unreasonable. What would you do, say about a reasonable statute? I think most other statutes of this kind have a one-year statute of limitation, so a statute of limitation would make a big difference. I have in my written testimony about nine suggestions at the end. Okay, Ms. We don't want to change and make this a, a giant. Thank you. Mr. Zavari, would you comment on the impact of what Ms. Walker just said? Should we enact that? Yeah, first, with respect to a cap on damages, what, what you end up with is basically becomes cost of doing business and a cap on damages would basically just be a, an essentially an annulment of this statute. It's the risk of getting- Why would it be an annulment of the statute? Because it's the risk of getting hit hard that makes these companies pay attention and do the right thing. That's the only thing that keeps them in the guardrails. The, the second thing with respect to these affirmative defenses, what they're basically talking about is defenses that would swallow the entire rules. She's saying cell phones in her paper, that cell phones should be exempted. I mean, that's the whole kit and caboodle. And then with respect to a four-year statute of limitations, there's no reason to change the statute of limitations. Well, I agree, and it's certainly you. Um, let me ask, um, what would be the effect, Mr. Zavari, on the consumers if Congress altered the private right of action or limited the ability in, in any of the ways that are being suggested? I, I think it would be the Wild West. I think our cell phones would become virtually unusable. I, there would be, uh, th there's almost no government enforcement. It is, the, it is deliberately set up for private enforcement and without private enforcement, uh, it, it would cause an amazingly negative impact on the economy, our privacy, and our ability to conduct private and personal affairs on our phones. And would you comment on Mr. Sweeney's predicament? Look, I, I think that is, uh, that is awful, but I would note that he was not sued, and I would note that it appears to be one bad actor, and he uh, has already expressed that he does have a means of redress that he is already considering, which is a RICO action. I do not in any way condone what happened to Mr. Sweeney, but I do believe that there are avenues in the law to, to deal with that. And do you believe that Rule 11 is one of those avenues? Absolutely. Thank you very much. I, I yield back. Is the gentleman from Texas uh, prepared? If not, I, I, can go, I can go ahead and go for here. Okay. All right. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'll now recognize myself uh, for questions. Uh, Mr. Hoffman, there are apps, I understand, that can be downloaded uh, to your smartphone that completely automate the lawsuit process. Um, they let the user select any incoming call uh, to be sent to the sponsoring law firm and the, the following is from one of the app websites, and it says, quote, if you receive a robocall, a telemarketing call, or a debt collection call, the app is ready. When you respond to a few quick prompts, the app creates a legal documentation of the call, uh, unquote. And then the call, then the law firm reviews the call log, 
quote, the firm evaluates the documentation for violation of the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. If there is a violation of law, you take the caller to court for up to $1,500 per call. Now remember, this is a, is a zero out-of-pocket cost to you to bring this TCPA claim uh, because even the app is free. Uh, so I guess I, I would ask you, do you think the, the TCPA creates incentives for attorneys to prey on the very people they claim to seek to protect and how can well-intentioned businesses be protected from those so for such claims? Thank you, Mr. Franks, for that question. Uh, I just would like to uh, pick up just, to, just for a moment uh, to the previous uh, answers. If this is not about money, then why has, the, uh, why has there been such a proliferation of uh, sort of entrepreneurial and, and uh, sort of uh, enterprising not only attorneys, but others seeking to, to really leverage the TCPA in the last uh, five to ten years, uh, five years or so, uh, since there's been such an ambiguity in the, in the interpretation of TCPA. We have a cottage industry, uh, Mr. Chairman, that has sprung up essentially uh, helping to inform otherwise uh, indivi individuals to come into the, uh, the fold of uh, enterprising plaintiff's attorneys uh, there is now, if you go online, there is a how-to a how-to manual on how to successfully bring a TCP action, TCPA action and reap hundreds of thousands of dollars. Clearly, this is not what uh, Congress intended in 1991 uh, to guard against uh, telemarketers. And so I would suggest that uh, uh, the committee and, and the Congress, uh, this committee and the Committee of Jurisdiction, the Energy and Commerce as well, look at look at these uh, abuses of the statute and seek some sort of uh, uh, measure to adjust what really has been abused. It's, it's quite ingenious what, what lawyers have done. They've used now social media. They've, they're using uh, technology to leverage uh, the, the loopholes within the TCPA. Not not, again, my, my primary issue, Mr. Chairman, is that this is not inuring to the benefit of consumers. You know, if this were, uh, if this statute was being used to, you know, fight against uh, the big bad uh, corporations who were harming consumers and, 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 and really uh, making those consumers whole, that's a whole different story. But what we have is a small group, growing group, of uh, plaintiff's lawyers, and I have nothing against lawyers, I happen to be one and I'm married to one, but the fact of the matter is these guys are getting rich using this statute that was intended for something else altogether. Thank you, sir. Ms. Walquist, do you have any thoughts that you might want to add to that? Get that microphone on. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. The app that you're talking about is used by a firm um, in particular that is very active in the TCPA front. And it's been interesting to watch as the head of that firm and one of the associates have been in a lawsuit with each other. And the disclosures they're talking about in some of the pleadings that they're bringing lawsuits on behalf of people who might not even know that they're in a lawsuit. And, um, you know, sending really is automation, letters. isn't it? I'm sorry? That really is automation, isn't it? And th that sometimes they find out that they've sued a company when they find out that there's a settlement to be had. So it's not inuring to the benefit, really, of those consumers um, who use the app. But more than the apps, I mean, Generally, that firm brings a lot of individual actions. It is the class actions that get to the point where as soon as you have a big enough company with a big enough bulk of calls, it, it almost doesn't matter if they have a good defense unless they're willing to just dig in and fight, um, which I've had some clients that do, and then you have to go all the way through summary judgment or class certification. The settlements just roll through and happen. Um, and I do want to point out that the Caribbean Cruise settlement that Mr. Zaveri talked about I don't know if those numbers were adding up because it was a $76 million settlement involving 50 million calls. I don't think that's really $135 per person. So I, I get the point that maybe the individual per person damages doesn't matter as much as deterrence, but the issue here is that what th these lawsuits can't deter unless you just stop all communications with customers and your clients, and especially necessary communications that they need. If you want to keep communicating about things that need to be communicated, you're at risk of a TCPA lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all. I'm going to go ahead and now and let's see. Mr. Rask. I'm sorry? Mr. Rask. 
I guess we're, we're, this is the third ranking member we've had here today. Uh, so I now recognize Mr. Roskin for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you very much, and thanks to all of the, the witnesses. Um, I just want to ask a couple general questions just to see what the uh, realm of consensus is on the panel. Um, d does everybody still agree that unwanted robocalls and text messages constitute an invasion of privacy? Is there anybody who disagrees with that? I think it depends on what, when you say unwanted, um, if somebody has signed a contract with a company and said, you can contact me if I'm behind on my bills um, or in these things, and then they get the text message, and at that point they say, I didn't want this, that's a different thing because then they should sure. be able to communicate and say, now I don't want any more Okay, how about unauthorized and unwanted? Unauthorized and unwanted, I'm okay. Okay. Um, and um, does everybody agree that businesses should not be able to um, send telemarketing robocalls and texts to the cell phones of people who have not authorized it and with whom they're not in a business relationship? Does everybody agree to that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, does everybody agree that a business should not be able to robocall or text someone if um, the person has revoked consent and has said, I don't want to receive texts or calls? Everybody agrees to that? Okay. Um, so I, I suppose then the, the question is whether or not we have uh, sufficient authority within the courts um, to handle abusive litigation practices. You know, when, when um, Ms. Walquist, when you say that, you know, there are cases of uh, lawyers bringing lawsuits on behalf of people who don't even know the litigation exists, I mean, that's outrageous, but um, isn't that already a violation of legal ethics for a lawyer to purport to represent someone who's not engaged um, the person in a retainer agreement, engaged a lawyer in a retainer agreement? I mean, I think the problem is that a lot litigation can get really far down the road before that comes out. So just a couple weeks ago, there was a big class action, kind of victory on the defense side, where a class was denied certification because the main plaintiff uh, was not an adequate representative because of not really knowing what the litigation was about and so forth. But to get to that point, you had to go through so much cost of defense that that's the problem with TCPA, that, that even if you think you have a good a good claim that the plaintiff is maybe abusing the system, there's so much money at stake that the temptation to settle becomes so enormous that it just keeps feeding the beast. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, th there's one case that I see here from actually February of this year in the Southern District of California where uh, a plaintiff brought a TCPA claim um, alleging unauthorized text messages after purportedly opting out and then it turned out that the person had not opted out, but had kind of arranged it in such a way that there would be a lawsuit, a cause of action. And the court rejected it, and the court said that's not what the meaning of the statute. We're trying to go after real abuses, and we don't want this to be you know, a trap for the unwary business any more than we want millions of people to have their, their privacy and their solitude invaded by the robocalls. I would say if all courts were like that court, we probably wouldn't be here. But the problem is that, that most courts, I've been defending these for more than a decade and more than 15 years, and most courts do not take that stand um, when things have been raised about the, the plaintiff. So if, let me just pursue it with you then. Is it, is it your contention after spending a lot of time doing these cases that there really are no more abuses going on that when we look out on the landscape of the country, the real abuses are taking place by lawyers and plaintiffs. It's no longer taking place by businesses that are engaged in robocalling. And no, texting. there are definitely abuses businesses in robocalling. I've stayed home from work and gotten the phone ringing all day, and I know what's going on there. Yeah. Those are not the companies that are being sued. Those aren't the companies that I'm representing. Those are the generally overseas-based spamming kind of calls that are happening that I don't see anybody going after or trying to stop through our court system. That is not, I mean, I think everyone is being driven crazy by those kinds of calls. But why not? Why are they not the, the subject of litigation? I, I don't think the money's there to sue after. If it's a, 
it's hard to find out who's making the calls. They're spoofed. Mm -hmm. I can tell you who does get sued for those calls sometimes. If the call uses a brand name, for example, GE, when they're trying to sell something, then GE will find itself getting demands and saying, you know, we're going to sue you under the TCPA for calls it has nothing to do with, but the calls are mentioning its brand name. Mm -hmm. So I think the problem is there's these just spam calls, but the identity of who is calling and it's very hard to trace, and it's not where the abuse of the litigation is coming from. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. I now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gomer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and appreciate the witnesses being here. It is an interesting subject. I, I, until I was preparing for this hearing, I didn't realize that this had been a uh, source of great litigation. It surprised me. Um, I've gotten a message from my eye doctor. I haven't been in a number of years, and they said, hey, it's really time you come back. I'm glad they let me. I didn't even thought about it. Um, so when it comes to healthcare-related communications, uh, that can really be a great help uh, to get notices like that. So I'm wondering uh, for anybody, how can the FCC uh, be more clear that healthcare related communications, though they technically may not have been requested or may fill out a, we may not have, I, I don't know if I filled out anything indicating I'm open to getting notices of, of um, the need for appointments, but uh, how can they make it more clear that that would be an exception and be okay for anybody? I can tell you, um the, the problem is that there are a few exceptions that were listed in 2015 related to health care, but they're very narrow exceptions that also... And they're specifically listed. Right? They're specific. So the problem is when Walgreens settled for $11 million recently, as Mr. Hoffman noticed, that was for flu, flu shot reminder text messages. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm. No, that was prescription refill reminder text messages. Rite Aid right now is being sued for flu shot reminders. Um, I have worked with various um, people in the medical profession who want to do as your eye doctor did and send text messages and are so nervous to do it because of the TCPA and the litigation that could ensue. I've represented um, a blood bank that was that had people sign up to get text messages if, every time you were available again, and then that phone number was provided for a relative and not the person who was actually signing the form. And then the relative said, now I'm going to sue you because I'm not the one who said, tell me when I can deliver blood again. Mm -hmm. So there, the FCC was so very So how do they, how, what would be the remedy to making clear that these should be exceptions? That it's not marketing calls, that when they are about health and uh, reminders and it's something to do with your health process that it shouldn't be covered in here. And of course, People can always retain the ability to opt out if they don't like those messages. So you could have replied stop to that, and at that point it becomes a different mm. ball game. Mm. And as we're talking, I'm wondering if uh, plaintiffs might have a claim, plaintiffs who get the flu because they didn't get notices because the plaintiff's firm sued, if they might have a claim against the plaintiff's firm because the plaintiff's firm hadn't sued, they would have gotten their flu shot notice, they would have gotten the shot and wouldn't have gotten the flu. Anyway, just thinking out loud. Um, should the FCC release some kind of information to indicate um, existing emergency exemptions are available to allow communications uh, for those emergency situations? Do you think that would be helpful? Uh, Mr. Gomer, you, you put your put your finger on two of the big issues that surround this TCPA uh, matter altogether. One is the ambiguities that exist with the statute. And two is uh, how do you really put into policy uh, some common sense, right? So you're talking about the ability to have uh, your eye doctor or some yeah. health care provider contact you with a very reasonable, legitimate purpose. Uh, uh, Mr. Sweeney talked about uh, his capacity to provide emergency alert or emergency information to his clients. 
These are all basic fundamental uh, pr uh, functions of uh, what we want. I mean, when we sign up for things, whether, we're, uh, whether we, op we can certainly opt out, but we, we, want a, we want that information. I think with respect to the FCC, and I'm no longer there, so I'm not speaking on their behalf, but just based on uh, my short time there, I would suggest that uh, this, uh, this, the, this line of, uh, of inquiry uh, is ripe for further uh, review by the commission as it looks at TCPA another time, the, the second time around. Uh, we're waiting for a circuit court opinion, as you know, to come out, and I think that uh, given a newly constituted FCC, there may be a different approach. So I would suggest that uh, any encouragement you might provide this body uh, to that uh, independent agency. So you want the FCC to clarify? Absolutely, sir. I think I think the FCC should do so. I think it has it has the is given the authority under the statute to promulgate the rules and the regulations. And so that's something you'd like to see. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. I appreciate your being here. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the distinguished chairman of the full committee, Mr. Goodlatte. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your holding this hearing. I, I am fascinated by it. Uh, I certainly am one of those who complains about unwanted phone calls coming into uh, my home. When the caller ID says unknown name, I turn to my wife and say, well, if they don't know their name, why are they calling me? Hmm. Uh, but uh, it is very frustrating, uh, and uh, I am not opposed to trying to have uh, uh, a federal remedy for this. But I am, I am very disturbed about what I perceive to be a consequence of this, which is that important information going out to people that may need to have it, sometimes commercial information, uh, sometimes non-commercial, but important information uh, is going to be increasingly discouraged uh, if these lawsuits can arise uh, and the size of the damages that uh, seem to come down in some of these cases can occur uh, with a legitimate company that simply uh, wants to remind you that you need to have your prescription refilled that cost him $11 million. Uh, Mr. Hoffman, what were some of the other ones you cited, the large damage amounts? Give me a moment, sir. <clears throat> so we have, uh, and this is, I think, going back to about 2012, um, Capital One for $75 million, ATT Mobility for $45 million, Sirius XM for 35 million, JP Morgan Chase for 34 million, Bank of America for 32 million, MedLife, an insurance company for 23 million. Let, let me, let me, that's enough. Let me, let me just ask you, what did these companies do that, that caused them to deserve a 34, 35, 45, 75 million dollar judgment against them? So Mr. Chairman, I'm going to punt to, uh, Becca over there, who probably has a better recollection no, I was, of this. I now. was working on a couple of those. Um, there's only, of the ones that he just listed, there were only two that involved marketing calls uh, or, or marketing communications. Um, one that he mentioned, MetLife, was, as I already said, it was one uh, agent in an office in Florida who knew that he wasn't supposed to send marketing faxes and set up a fax server in his garage and managed to send millions of faxes uh, you know, uh, because he was on a commission basis and wanted to encourage that. Uh, so it was a one-person a one thing. With SiriusXM, that was also a telemarketing-related where they were calling people who had um, gotten the, the free trial when you get a new car uh, to see if they wanted to continue their, their service, and they were sued by somebody who said, I, I gave the number to the dealer, but I didn't tell the dealer. So why did that cost them $35 million? What was the... What was the calculation behind uh, why asking if you've got a service in your car, you want to, do you want to continue to or not because it's going to automatically terminate if you don't? So we're calling to remind you, why would that cost them $35 million? These settlements are all just indicators of the potential size of the class and the value at which... A why wouldn't a judge just say, well, what's the big deal here? We're sorry. Uh, maybe that's a technical violation of this law, but it's not worth $35 million. Unfortunately, all the violations of this law, for the most part, are technical violations because you don't have to have any actual damages. Okay, so let me so. ask you about that. Um, <coughs> you, the, the, the court determines, that, or there's a settlement, I don't know which one, but a $35 million payment. How much of that money actually reaches the 
hundreds of thousands or millions of plaintiffs in that class action lawsuit who had no idea that this was even going on? It depends on the take rate for the settlement. So the attorneys will usually ask for somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of that fund, um, which is interesting. But they get for attorney's fees. For attorney's fees, even though the statute doesn't have an attorney's fees provision. So they nine get. Nine or ten million dollars? Did they put nine or ten million dollars worth of legal work into doing that? It sounds like a lot of money for people who are going to get. And what did the people well, who got, what did the people who were Sirius XM customers and I assume they continue to, in many instances, to be customers. I, I could I could find out and and report back to you um, the exact amount that people that ended up sending in claims got from that settlement, because um, I'm not sure offhand. But I know that there's a depending on how many what percentage of the class members turned in forms, they would have gotten a different amount of money. Um, oftentimes, a lot of settlements that I've been involved with. The ending result, if everyone would have turned in their forms, would be somewhere between like three and twelve dollars. But then, because maybe only eight percent of the people turn in their forms, they get a larger chunk. It just depends. Why would they get a larger chunk? There's 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 a certain amount of damage that occurred to them, and that presumably was the basis for the overall settlement or the overall judgment. Why would they get a larger piece of the pie if other people said, "I'm not going to." bother with that? Because the way you're doing the settlements for the most part is, here's the big amount of money that we're going to give you to buy ourselves out of this litigation, and that's it, and so it's just going to be pro rata split up. But this whole how these are litigation wouldn't exist if this statute were clearly drawn to uh, acknowledge that there are different kinds of phone calls, both commercial and non-commercial, legitimate purposes and non-legitimate purposes, and so on, and fraud or not fraud. I mean, the ones who are actively, the ones that bother me the most, both faxes and uh, telephone calls, are the people who are obviously trying to commit fraud. Uh, frankly, I don't see as much of that, particularly on the fax machine as I used to. I used to file these complaints myself with the, uh, with the government. But uh, it disturbs me that uh, we would think that, that this law should be used uh, to stop people from attempting to communicate for legitimate purposes uh, if that uh, uh, purpose uh, is one that somebody doesn't want to have. Yes, there should be some kind of penalty for that. I don't disagree with that, but uh, enormous uh, uh, judgments or forced into settlements because they're going uh, before uh, some judge or jury that uh, is not uh, recognizing the importance of communications in our society. That, that really bothers me. I don't know what the solution is at this point, but I think we ought to try to find one. I can tell you in the recent DISH uh, order that came out of Illinois with the judge, uh, this was an action because the regulators do bring actions under the TCPA um, from time to time. And she said that the amount of damages, looking at the amount of allegations, that the damages would have been $8.1 billion just for the TCPA claims alone, and then you know carved it down into the hundreds of millions instead, adding everything up. But the, you really can get to billions of dollars. I have several cases I'm on where the actual damages would be billions of dollars. If actual claimed damages. The actual claimed damages Not would be actual billions of lost, dollars. I don't know what, what the, the lost value of my annoyance and inconvenience of picking up the phone or looking at my caller ID and not picking up the phone but hearing the phone ring is, but I don't think it's... Yeah. Uh, worth some of the risks that we take by discouraging communications like this. That's why I've always my thought time's, of uh, My time has greatly expired, so I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your forbearance. And I thank the gentleman, and uh, I would thank the witnesses for attending today, I thank the audience and the members, and this concludes today's hearing. Uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.